Honor, may it please the court, my name is uh, Phil Daniello. I'm with the law firm of Fassett Anthony and Taylor PA. And I'm appearing here today as counsel for both Island Club Resort Homeowners Association, which I'll refer to as Association, and Island Club Resort Development, Inc., who I'll refer to as the developer. The proceedings brought before this court are a little unusual since there are two sets of lawyers here, each claiming to represent the association. Yet, as will be discussed, this is not without precedent, and as this court has done in the past, in the Raisin versus A Milestone case, and other Florida courts have had to deal with the situation where two sets of attorneys claim to represent the interests of one party and decide both who represents the party and, and, and the merits of the case. The first case is a petition for certiorari of an order granting a motion to substitute attorneys. Declared that the, in the middle of litigation, that the law firm of South Millhausen was counsel for the association based on an unlawfully called, improperly noticed board meeting, and that the, uh, that where the developer was not given notice, was not given an agenda, and that the board members were not given proper notice of the meeting. This order was entered despite the developer immediately exercising its veto rights over the board actions and removing those directors that acted improperly. The other appeal is a final summary judgment determining that the association was required to be turned over. The overriding theme of both appeals is the trial court's complete disregard for the governing documents, the declaration and the bylaws which govern the operation of the association. The, court, the trial court's decisions could only be rendered by disregarding, first, the notice provisions for a board meeting, requiring that notices be sent seven days in advance, be sent by a board member or the president, be sent to the developer, and be sent with a particularized agenda, and ignoring the anti-waiver provisions of the declaration, and finding that waivers had occurred when no analogous situation had ever existed despite three separate provisions in the declaration, which include an anti-waiver provision. Also by ignoring the objection procedures for board meetings. Objections were made at the board meeting by one of the board members. The, the objection procedure in the declaration and bylaws is identical, virtually identical, to that in chapter 617.071 sub 5b. It follows the law. The trial court also, also ignored the developer's veto rights stated in the declaration to veto any unauthorized action by the board, and finally ignored the developer's right to remove and replace directors that it had appointed, which the developer did the very next day after the unlawful meeting. Thus, even if all the notice provisions were somehow waived and the board had hired South Millhausen on August 22nd, the day of the meeting, the very next day the developer vetoed the action and uh, removed the two directors, appointed a new director, and those directors rehired Facet Law. If you somehow ignore the veto, the fact remains that as of August 23rd, those directors were no longer directors. When looking at the summary judgment order, the court the trial court ignored the turnover provisions of the declaration stating that the turnover of the association can only occur when the individual owners reach 85% of all interests or 95% of all lots have been sold. The trial court also ignored provisions of the bylaws as well as controlling precedent that states that the bylaws are subject to the terms of the declaration. Both the bylaws and the declaration clearly state that the bylaws are subject to the declaration. The declaration had a differing turnover provision. And at the time of these events, what was the percentages? Far below 85% or 95%, far below. I think we were talking about 70%. I specifically calculated in our brief, I don't recall off the top of my head, but it was far, far below the percentages. Um, the trial court also ignored the developer's right to amend the bylaws where they both the bylaws and the declaration specifically state that the developer could amend any ambiguous um, section of the declaration or to clarify it on its own. That's what it did. 
Well, buying laws had this provision that said the board of administration will be turned over after seven years. There is no board of administration. That's a condo doc document term. This is an HOA. The bylaws essentially had a typo in them. The declaration had a different statement. The de developer corrected that, amended the bylaws, and made the bylaws conform with the declaration, which from the very beginning, the declaration and the bylaws both said that the declaration controls. Remind me, though, that the, the seven-year provision is in both. No. It's just in the... Seven-year provision is in 3.2 E1 of the bylaws. bylaws. Okay. And it refers to a non-existent board of administration. And as the affidavit of the developer stated, that this was a mistake, that this provision was cobbled from uh, another condo doc that had been being, being prepared at the same time. It didn't mean, it wasn't meant to apply. There is no board of administration. And, and is there a mandatory turnover period within the statutes that govern, govern these kinds of developments? I believe there is a mandatory provision at certain percentage, but it's, a, it's either at or above the percentage. It's a percentage and not a timing then? Oh, no time limit okay. not that I'm aware okay. of. Um, off the top of my head, I'm pretty sure there's not a time limit. I'm sorry if I'm not 100% I'm not on that. Now, looking at the substitution order, the trial court st stated that, just blank, bl plainly stated that the corporate formalities were met. Yet, the declaration wasn't met at all. And chapter 617-0701 sub 1 states that the time and manner of notice shall be determined by the corporate documents. Here, the record is clear that not a single corporate formality was met. This court has held that the failure of a condo association board to comply with notice requirements prescribed by the association's bylaws and declarations rendered the actions moot. That's this court's case law, Bramson versus Beaumead, or Beaumont. Does it make a difference if we, if the trial court were to believe some of the testimony that this was an emergency meeting? I, I don't see how the trial court could believe that, and I'll get to that point. If, if, if there was a, an emergency meeting, the notice requirements are different. Is that correct? If there was an emergency meeting, you can do away with notice requirements. However, it doesn't do away with the develop, developer's veto rights and right to remove and replace the board of directors that it had appointed, which it did. So even if there's an emergency, the actions are void. The developer vetoed it. Um, so if, if the homeowners believe that the developer is basically stealing from them, what were they supposed to do? Well, they, they have an outlet for that. They can go to a court of law and ask for damages. They did file a claim with the state attorney's office, and the state attorney did investigate that. At the time that this happened, the developer, um, the, the individual in question, David Meadows, who is the principal of the developer, not the developer, David Meadows had been removed as a president and director two months prior. He was no longer president and director. One of the directors that attended this meeting um, signed the consent appointing a new president two months prior. So he is no longer had any control or access to the association at the time was of this meeting. Was the law meeting. firm that was removed his law firm as well? Not at the time. Um, it was his attorney uh, law firm previously. My firm did previously represent Mr. De Mr. Meadows individually. We withdrew, and at the time of the uh, meeting, uh, separate counsel was representing him. Um, you know, what's, for, what's interesting is, is, as I understand the statute that went into place, Mr. Meadows can't have any any. Uh, authority with the association. Yes. But as a matter of, of, of corporate law, he's the only guy in the developer. Well, the I developer's a corporation, as I understand it, and he's the president, sole shareholder, treasurer, etc. Well, there, uh, there's no actual evidence in the record that talks about whether or not he is the sole shareholder. I believe that um, he and his wife are, are the shareholders. I don't see any reason why a, de a developer could not appoint um, a, a third party or give a proxy to a third party. The developer has its own corporate identity. Well, I understand that, but the fact of the matter is Mr. Meadows 
who through the corporation, the developer continues to run the, tries to run the association in contravention of the statute. I think that's a mistake that the trial court made, Your Honor, is okay. that he wasn't trying to run the association. All the developer did was exercise, was first to ask for its notice rights, and second, exercise its veto rights and exercise its rights to remove and appoint directors. It had appointed the two directors in question. It removed them. They admitted that they had been appointed by the developer. He then exercised his right to appoint one and sent a notice to the residents that they could appoint another director in a conformity with the bylaws and declaration. He wasn't controlling the association. He wasn't, had no access to the association's funds, records, et cetera. He simply was acting as the principal of the developer, and the developer did what it was allowed to do contractually and under the law. With regard to the first case, you're here on cert. Yes. And in order to prevail on cert, you've got to show there's a departure from the essential requirements of the law, which you know is a very high standard. Can you tell me how you think you've hit it? Yes, Your Honor. The trial court in this case departed from the essential part of the law because it did not follow either the law regarding the mandatory following of the corporate formalities. It did not follow the law requiring the precedent that states that the declaration shall control over the bylaws. In this particular case, the trial court departed from the material law because it didn't follow the law, didn't follow the declaration, didn't follow the bylaws. It essentially made up law on its own. An example is where the trial court states that they had the right to do it. But you have to show us how the court departed from the essential requirements of the law, not that below the parties did. You have to show that the court basically in applying the law in this situation basically totally missed it. I mean, it's a very, very high showing you have to make. I agree. And in this case, you have case law and a statute that says that the corporate formalities must be met. Here, the trial court ignored the corporate formalities. It ignored the statute, 617-0701. It ignored the case law. The Yarnell Warehouse case law is another one of this court's cases that say you have to follow. The Bramson case is a condo association case that says if you don't follow the declaration, it's void as a matter of law. And the Supreme Court has stated that the bylaws of a corporation can constitute a binding agreement. The court later goes on, the trial court later goes on to state that it wasn't reasonable. In other words, the court is saying something that you can't do in any contract. You can't take a contractual provision and say the enforcement of that provision is unreasonable. He doesn't like the provision. Okay. But you can't simply ignore it. You have to apply the provision that's written. The case law says so. The statute says so. The trial court ignored them. The trial court failed to state or any contractual basis for his conclusions. It concluded in paragraph one of its order that the board acted within its powers when hiring the respondent legal counsel. Yet under the governing document, action only can be taken one of two ways. Through a properly noticed meeting with the developer present and an agenda or through written consent of the board after giving the developer ten days notice with an opportunity to object. Neither of those things happened. So the trial court got that wrong. This court in the Raisin v. Milestone case stated very clearly that to extent there's a conflict in a member controlling a company that he was actually suing, that the governing documents, no matter how odd the provision, no matter how weird the conflict seemed, the governing documents stated who controlled and who got to hire counsel and that this court was powerless to rewrite the agreement in order to make it more reasonable. That's what the trial court did. Departed from the requirements of law by just saying I don't like this provision. I'm going to rewrite it. It's not reasonable. I'm not going to follow it. Can't do that, Your Honor. The trial court claimed that the board had a right to act through written consent. It didn't. As discussed, it does not 
It cannot until notice is provided to the developer. The trial court claimed that no notice was, meet, was needed because there was an emergency. Chapter 617-0303, sub 5, states that an emergency is defined as a catastrophic event and only to prevent imminent loss. But the cert order only remo removes your law firm as counsel for the, the association, right? Is that what it does? It does, but it also has other language in there that is quite distressing by essentially completely disregarding the corporate identity of the developer. But in but terms yes, of its function, its it, function it, is the thing it, that if it departs from the essential requirements, it's, it's in removing your law firm, right? It, it, yes, it does parts. And at the time of the hearing, your law firm represented the developer. Yes. And the homeowners association. I'm sorry. At the time of the hearing, my firm had actually withdrawn for a period in representing the developer. We subsequently reappeared on behalf of the developer. But at the time of this hearing. Here, here today, you're representing the developer. Yes, but both the association and the developer. We reappeared on behalf of the developer. We had only been withdrawn from representing the developer about a month prior to the substitution and, and order you don't hearing. think that the evidence at the evidentiary hearing was sufficient to at least show that your, your firm was in a bit of a conflict situation from that standpoint? No, we don't believe so. No, the, 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 the law is very clear. We're an association that hires counsel. Um, that counsel is generally going to be in a conflict with the members to a degree. Even the Florida uh, rules, uh, uh, the bar rules, um, have a provision. The state where you represent an entity, you don't necessarily represent the shareholders or the members, and that conflicts between them. But the question is, you, you can't, the, the developer and the association are not one and the same legal entity. They are not, and they have no direct conflict between them, Your Honor. And none was raised, and none's been discussed uh, by the trial court um, or raised in the matter below. Um, moving on to the emergency. We discussed the emergency. Uh, there's no record evidence that this meeting was called as an emergency. In fact, the claim that this meeting was an emergency is complete fabrication. It's an outright lie. If you look at the record evidence, they, they claim this later on to get around the screw up. The email for the meeting didn't say it was an emergency. The telephone call to Director Rabin didn't say it was an emergency. They said it 10 days in the future, no catastrophic event. When they were questioned under oath as to the nature of the emergency, they couldn't articulate one. Director Williams claimed under oath that the emergency was a result of the condition of the property which he disliked for seven years. It's not an emergency. Director Caldas claimed that the emergency was due to the fact that the, quote, head of the community had been arrested. Yet she then admitted that she knew he had with, withdrawn as director and president two months before and that she signed the consent retaining a new president. So the, there, there was no emergency there. But he was arrested for what charges? He, he was arrested um, on, under the continuing charges, which have not been proven. They're not actually part of this record, other than the fact that he's been arrested for a misappropriating association assets, which. And I guess I mean, so someone believed there was probable cause to believe that he had stolen from the association. And it, it, that's a little bit different than he was arrested for DUI or shoplifting or. Something That's else. correct, but he had been removed under the, the prior statute. He had already, before the statute became effective, he had already resigned and they had appointed a new president. And there was an injunction order in place that the, the, that the association knew about that barred him from controlling the association or having access to the association's funds. So the fact that he, he was rearrested under essentially the same charges, which he argues are trumped up charges, had no effect on the association. He couldn't, at that point in time, he didn't control anything. Uh, there was a new president, new directors. Um, he had been arrested before, and he wasn't the head of the community anymore. They waited 10 days. That alone tells you it's not an emergency. Where's the catastrophic event? You're, you're about 18 minutes in, by the way. I don't know how much you want to save for rebuttal, but I'm going to give you 25 for sure. Uh, just two, two more minutes to, to, to cover, uh, Your Honor. Um, uh, a bit of the summary judgment order. Um, again, Florida law requires that governing documents control. In the summary judgment order, we have an issue of we have 
conflicting terms. We have a de declaration that specifically states the terms of turnover and bylaws that state a different turn turnover for the Board of Administration that doesn't exist. Now, this court has stated in the Edelbit versus Free case that where a contract states it's subject to another term or document, that that term or document must control. Both the bylaws and the declaration specifically say that the bylaws are subject to. So even if you interpret the Board of Administration language in the bylaws as the Board of Directors, which you can't, but if you do, the bylaws and the declaration and the substantive law in Florida state that the declaration controls over the bylaws. And I've cited three cases on point uh, in, in Florida which state that declaration controls over bylaws. They argue that there was a vested right of the members to control the association. There wasn't a vested right. There was conflicting provisions. The express subordination of the bylaws was stated in the law and in the declaration. The right to amend ambiguous provisions was granted in the declaration and bylaws. And the rule of law requiring the, by the declaration to be control to control means that the, the plaintiffs never had a vested right. A vested right has been defined by this court as a mixed, uh, an immediate fixed right. It didn't exist at the time. At no time can it be said the plaintiff had a fixed right to the turnover of the association after seven years. It didn't apply. The court also ignored the material issues of fact and ignored the requirement that the uh, matter be presented for pre-suit mediation. I'll reserve the rest of my time, okay. Your Honor. Thank Bye. you. May it please the court. Scott R. Ross of South Millhausen to argue against certiorari on behalf of respondents. I'll be giving the argument against certiorari, so I would like to uh, reserve half the time for Apolli Fernandez to argue against summary judgment. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Petitioners are not entitled to a root of certiorari for three reasons. They cannot meet the exacting requirements for issuance of a root of certiorari. They have no standing to file this proceeding, and the substitution order is entitled to be upheld on its merits. In order to uh, be entitled to a uh, root of certiorari, petitioners need to demonstrate that there has been a uh, departure from the essential requirements of the law, resulting in a material injury for the remainder of the case, which is not correctable on post-judgment appeal. This court instructs us in Parkway Bank versus Fort Myers Armature Works that the material injury for the remainder of the case, not correctable on post-judgment appeal, is analyzed for jurisdictional purposes prior to the court reaching whether there has been a departure from the essential requirements of the law. But if the developer, I mean, you can run in circles on this, but the, it seems to me that the central issue is whether or not the developer, the corporation that's the developer, still has legal rights to control the homeowners association. Because if it does, then, then the homeowners association has been deprived of its lawyer of choice, and we would normally treat that as something that would be cert reviewable. Certainly decisions of this and other courts hold that there is cert review uh, available for uh, trial court orders which disqualify counsel or in some cases uh, granting or denying motions for substitution of counsel. But the substitution order we are looking at here merely determines which of two competing law firms would represent the association uh, as the court uh, pointed out. And what was the legal proposition upon which one firm was picked over the other? I would suggest that among other considerations, Your Honor, uh, the court evaluated the prospect that uh, the FACET firm was in a conflict situation. However, the... Um, but there's no finding of that in this order. There, there is no finding of that in the substitution order, and that was not what was argued at the substitution hearing. But it, it would seem like what the court 
I have a hard time separating these two cases because they seem to be joined. And yes, the whole right. issue, as Judge Altenburn suggested, is when there is this turnover of the board based on uh, the declaration or the bylaws. And it would seem to me that that's what had to drive this decision. It would seem to me that the court had to be make that decision about whether there's been a turnover or not in order to decide which lawyer was in and which lawyer was out. And you, are you suggesting it's something other than that? If the court, uh, if, if you look at the substitution order itself and the proceedings that were conducted on it, the transcripts and the evidence received, what the trial court focused upon was the authority of the non-developer affiliated directors to take the actions on August 22nd, which they took. And I would submit that there was competent substantial evidence for the court to reach that conclusion for purposes of certain analysis. But if the developer on that date still continues to own the percentage of lots that give him 30% or more of, of the vote on this, as, as I read the bylaws as before amendment at least, he's entitled to control. Uh, well, there's a couple of uh, important considerations, Your Honor. First of all, uh, as I believe Fernandez will argue, I believe, the clear and unambiguous provisions of bylaw section three required turnover to occur seven years after recordation of the original declaration. It is absolutely undisputed that that time period had passed. That, if that had elapsed. That that had lapsed, Your Honor. So, so if that was enforceable, the turnover was permitted simply on that basis. That is accurate, Your Honor, and that's- So the, we really, the, what we have to figure out is does the declara condo declaration or, or the declaration control or do the bylaws control? Because one provides for this passage of time, the other provides for this percentage of lots, correct? Isn't that the whole issue in, in both of these cases? I would submit, Your Honor, that that's the ultimate issue and that at least in resolving the summary judgment that, that, that this court will need to address that issue. I would submit that with respect to the propriety of certiorari, the court returns to the standard upon which it reviews the trial court's order. And that under the standard, this order uh, should not be reviewable on cert whatsoever. Because again, focusing on the order itself, this is an order granting substitution of counsel. It is effectively an order which is internal with respect to petitioner association only. It does not grant any relief adverse to either petitioner in favor of another party. In and of itself, it does not take away any money or property from petitioner association or petitioner ICRD, the developer entity. All it does is determine which of two vying law firms and lawyers will represent petitioner association. On its face, that's perhaps true, but as soon as that order was entered, your law firm abandoned various theories and defenses that that the facet law firm had been raising and basically you conceded to the entry of the summary judgment that's on appeal, right? That's accurate, Your Honor. And so in terms of its effect on the lawsuit, it was it was striking. And so the the question is whether or not you know there's some risk here that the homeowners association is depriving the developer of due process. And I guess that's what concerns me a bit. That is the argument that's raised in the petition. So it's important to look at the procedural history leading up to the substitution hearing. Our law firm appeared of record for the association on September 10th, 2013. For a period of almost three weeks, the facet firm and my law firm exchanged submissions and the facet firm purported to withdraw everything we filed. So on September 30th, we filed the substitution motion, set it for later hearing. It was heard by the court and then granted immediately two days before the summary judgment hearing. There was no failure of due process in any sense which has been recognized by the Florida and federal courts in that no party was not placed on notice of the issues, given an opportunity to appear at the hearing. This was a two-day evidentiary hearing which elapsed over a period spanning more than a month, totaling more than three hours at which witnesses from both sides, and again, when I say sides, 
The movement denominated by the trial court was my law firm. The respondent was the facet firm. Witnesses from both sides testified. Documents were introduced, being the governing documents of the association, the notices, including the meeting notices and communications among the principals were introduced, and the court rendered its multi-paged, well-reasoned substitution order, which applied the law we submit correctly to the facts which it considered. Now, the petition suggests that there was no competent substantial evidence to support the relief granted. We believe that under the cert standard, there was more than enough competent substantial evidence and that more, most significantly, it's simply impossible for petitioner association to establish material injury for the remainder of the case, not correctable on appeal, for this simple reason. Petitioner association is itself a statutorily mandated homeowners association under Chapter 720. By legislative intent, it is effectively a neutral party with respect to the ultimate contested issues which the court is focusing upon, which is the developer versus homeowner interest, which are ultimately being disputed. Petitioner association had no property rights which were taken away. Petitioner association did not have a money judgment entered against it. It did not have any claims or defenses which were in any way abbreviated as a result of the substitution of counsel. With respect to petitioner ICRD, the substitution motion was not directed to it. It did not affect petitioner ICRD directly or immediately in any way. Now, as the court observes, there was an effect in a practical sense upon the subsequent proceedings to which petitioner ICRD was a party. But very importantly, for purposes of cert analysis and ultimately summary judgment review, petitioner ICRD was always represented at every point by not only Facet Firm, but its other counsel, Howard Spiegel. The record is very plain on this. As Mr. Dinello has told you during his argument, a time came earlier in the litigation which, for whatever reason, petitioners, defendants below, engaged in their own substitution of counsel. The record is completely clear on this. Facet Firm withdrew on behalf of all parties defendant below other than petitioner association. Mr. Spiegel represented ICRD and the other parties defendant going into the substitution hearing. This was not based on a motion to disqualify. This was based on a motion combined with consents of all the parties defendant. So that going into the substitution motion, Facet Firm had only one client. Upon rendition of the substitution order, Facet Firm had no client at the trial level. However, ICRD was represented by Attorney Spiegel. The substitution order itself did not affect ICRD's ability to submit materials to the trial court, to appear and argue at the summary judgment hearing, or to do anything else through the remainder of the trial level proceedings. So again, where is the material injury for the remainder of the case? How is any of this not correctable on post-judgment appeal? We would submit that neither petitioner can meet the exacting cert standard. And as an aside, previously respondents have moved to dismiss for lack of standing. Although the motions panel denied, the merits panel can revisit. And we would suggest that neither petitioner has standing to initiate the petition in the first place. I would point out to the court that its earlier decision in Raisin, which Mr. Dinello has argued on a couple of occasions, in that case, which arose from- Who has standing? If anybody would have had standing, Your Honor, it would have been the Facet Firm. As in the Raisin case, wherein one of the lawyers, Attorney Todd Norman from Broad and Cassell, chose to seek to invoke cert on his own behalf as the lawyer for what was denominated the second managing member of the LLC involved. 
Facet Firm was the respondent in the uh, substitution hearing. The, the, the clash of parties, if you will. I mean, these things sort of run in circles in a case like this because, you know, if, if there's an error in this thing, then you've got no right to be here on behalf of your clients either. So if, if we declare there's an error, then you've never had standing to be here, I guess. And, and in fact, Your Honor. That can put your head spinning in circles. I mean, you know. uh, as it has been at many times, and we had to, I say we, I stand here representing what's been called Respondent Association, adverse to Petitioner Association, and Petitioner ICRD uh, on prior order of this court, simply so that these arguments could be presented and that my law firm would have someone to argue for. It does tee up the basic prospect, is there a case in controversy? What lawyers representing which parties are arguing these positions before the court? These are usually primary issues that are not controversial going into any case. However, that is essentially what the court must resolve here. For purposes of cert review, however, none of these matters result in a material injury not correctable on post-judgment appeal, and this illustrates precisely why cert is so uh, sparingly granted because this will result in piecemeal appeals. Only one of seven counts of the verified complaint has been resolved at the summary judgment, also on appeal. The remainder has yet to proceed at the trial court while Judge Durden sorted out who represents one of the parties. Okay. You're about 12 minutes into your 10, so if you want to. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I, would, I will simply wrap up the next 30 seconds by suggesting that as we argue in our brief, the law does indeed support the well-reasoned substitution order. Case law of this court, including the Garcia decision from 2002, supports the proposition that governing documents of associations must uh, be enforced reasonably. That's not simply limited to amendments. In addition, Judge, because um, we are talking about vested rights. A corporation cannot simply amend its bylaws or take actions which impair the vested rights of its members. Uh, we've argued the authorities in our brief, and I will stand on that for the purposes of time, but for purposes of cert review, the well-reasoned substitution order was based on substantial competent evidence and a correct application of the law it should be upheld. Petitioners have no basis to seek uh, review on certiorari. Okay. Uh, thanks Thank to the you. court. May it please the court. <coughs> Brent Spain of Theory Act in Spain on behalf of FLE Jose Fernandez. As indicated, on the direct appeal on the summary judgment, the issue is whether or not the circuit court reversibly erred in granting final summary judgment in favor of Mr. Fernandez on count seven of the amended complaint. Briefly, count seven of the amended complaint was an action pursuant to section 720.305 Florida statutes to enforce the right of the owners in the Bimini Bay subdivision to elect at least a majority of the association's board of directors. As this court's well aware, summary judgments appropriate if there are no disputed issues of material fact and the moving parties entitled to summary judgment as a matter of law. The, refresh me on the counts that are remaining below. There are six counts remaining, Your Honor. Um, they involve slander of title, uh, conspiracy, a violation of Chapter 720, violation of the debt collection laws. And are those against the developer or Mr. Meadows or both? They are against the the developer, defendant David Meadows, they're also against two of the other former board members as well, some of those counts. So Mr. Meadows is a, is a party below? Correct, Your Honor. So he is a, actually a party here who has not appeared, apparently. Correct, because everybody by default is an appellee. Right. Okay. And I'm assuming things below are pretty much on hold while we resolve these two matters. Is that right? Yes, Your Honor. We had... Uh, there was a motion to disqualify filed by Mr. Ross. There was a hearing held on that. Uh, 
the issue came up on whether or not this case was stayed. We argued that it wasn't stayed, and the circuit court judge, in an abundance of caution, said that he would wait and not okay. proceed. Okay. Uh, help with me respect to this, me, help me understand your position relative to Mr. Tonello's. The the seven year period is in the bylaws, and there is no similar provision in the DEC, correct? Well, correct. There are actually no provisions in the declaration that actually sp speak to when turnover is triggered. Okay, so if if so, how do we now, if if the declarations trump bylaws? Help me understand. Tell me why Mr. Delano's position is incorrect. Sure, Your Honor. Well, one, the, the suggestion that the declaration trumps the bylaws uh, assumes that there's actually an inconsistency and a conflict between the two documents, which we submit there isn't. When you look in the circuit court to this and the final judgment, but when you look at the declaration, Article 3, Section 3 of the declaration is what's entitled turnover. And it expressly says that upon the happening of the event of developer turning control over to the association, a meeting shall be called where the members get to elect the board. It goes on to say, and I'm quoting, at such time as the developer is otherwise obligated to turn over control of the association, it shall be the affirmative obligation of the owners to elect directors and assume control of the association. And that's in the declaration. That's in Article 3, Section 3 of the Declaration, which is entitled Turnover. Okay. And then when you go to the bylaws, which the Articles of Incorporation state that the directors are elected as provided in the bylaws, and then when you go to Section 3.2 of the Association Bylaws, it states that the association will have three directors and that the board members will be designated by the developer or elected by the homeowners as follows and it has several triggers on when and how they'll be elected. And subsection one expressly states, homeowners other than the developer are entitled to elect not less than a majority of the members of the board, and it has several triggers, and paragraph E says seven years after recordation of the deed restrictions and covenants. What the appellant keeps pointing to is article three, section two of the declaration, which is actually entitled voting rights. That simply is establishing the two separate classes of membership in the association. It doesn't speak to anything with respect to turnover, when turnover is triggered. It speaks to when the developer's weighted voting rights would be extinguished. And quite frankly, those rights are extinguished automatically when turnover occurs under Florida statutes. Um, it's 720.3075, it's void as against public policy to attempt to extend those voting rights past Well, is, aren't the two, though, one and the same? I mean, if, if, if there's a determination of voting rights between the developer and the homeowners, isn't that the same as determining control? I, I would disagree, Your Honor, in that, again, Article 3, Section 3 is the specific provision, which is entitled turnover, and as you all know, the specific provision controls over a more general provision. And it specifically says, at such time as the developer is otherwise required to turn over control. It doesn't say, which the appellant has tried to suggest in its reply brief, that it says, at such time as the Class B membership ceases to exist. And, it, and Class B is the developer rights, right? Class, Class B, is, B the is the developer, which relates to the number of lots he owns and the votes he gets per lot. Well, when the weighted voting right. would extinguish. It doesn't speak to, again, when turnover happens. Turnover mm -hmm. and the election of board of directors is all spoken to and, and addressed in the bylaws. It's not addressed anywhere else in the governing documents. And it, is it your position that at the end of seven years it just ha happened automatically? After seven years of recording that declaration, the right to elect at least a majority of the board. The developer still has a right to exercise its voting rights. It still has a right to elect and vote and cast votes on the minority of the board. What is triggered automatically is that after seven years, the members get to elect at least a majority of that board. And that's a fairly common provision. Uh, as, as opposing counsel had indicated, it's common across the state or was very common across the state in condominiums. This is a townhome community. Well, this is a very common battle well, between a developer and homeowners when when the development, whether it's a condo or a 
subdivision change. I mean, this is a very, a very standard language, very common battle. This happens, unfortunately, a lot. Yes, Your Honor, it's, it's when turnover occurs. It's not, it's undisputed here that the declaration was recorded on November 2nd, 2001. It's undisputed that the seven years lapped on November 2nd, 2008. And it's undisputed that once my client asked for the turnover election to be held, that the developer then tried to unilaterally amend the bylaws to suddenly delete the voting provisions in the bylaws, which we would submit as a vested right as of November 2nd, 2008. And under this court's case law in First Florida, as well as the Surf Club case, a corporation can't amend its bylaws to impair a vested right. And also, as we indicated in our brief in the circuit judge's order states, is that once turnover is triggered, it's not whether turnover has actually occurred, it's once turnover is triggered, the developer can't take any steps to try to regain control of a homeowners association. It can't exercise any other authority to try to unring the bell or rewind the hands of the clock. And that's what occurred here is they essentially tried to rewind the clock three years, three and a half years and say, well, you don't have that right to elect at least a majority of the board because we've deleted the provision. And we'd submit that that's not allowed under Florida law. The appellants have also- So if, I don't mean to interrupt you, but Judge LaRose's question to you was to help us reconcile the, the, the conflict in the bylaws and the declaration, and you told us why there isn't a conflict. Let's assume there is a conflict. How do we resolve it? Let's assume we don't agree with your interpretation of the language and we say there is this different conflict. Yeah, well, if there's, there is an inconsistent provision in them, well, one, I think as a matter of law, you're, the court's role is to try to determine whether or not there's an ambiguity or there's an inconsistency. Uh, there are a couple provisions at, at play there. One, uh, an ambiguity should be construed strictly against the drafter, which is the appellant. In this case, it's the developer. A declaration in the bylaws, they're unilaterally drafted documents. Also, the case law, which we've cited in our uh, brief, it's well established that with respect to homeowners associations in particular, that any ambiguity in a declaration is strictly construed against the developer, which again is the appellant in this case. And they've tried to point out that there are ambiguities, that the bylaws say Board of Administration, but when you actually look at those bylaws provisions, Article 3, Section 3 of the bylaws is entitled Directors, Section 3.1 is entitled Board of Directors, and Section 3.2 states how the developer and the owners are going to elect those board members. The fact that it references board of administration is not an ambiguity or any inconsistency. This court has to read the document as a whole, not parse one sentence. Uh, and throughout the bylaws, it references board of directors, board, board of administration. And we even submitted a notice of supplemental authority that chapter 720 itself includes a reference to board of administration. So that. That issue, we submit a red herring. There's no inconsistency or conflict there with, well, they have a vested right to elect nobody because a board of administration doesn't exist. With respect to the bylaws and declaration, again, you go back to Article 3, Section 3 of the Declaration, entitled Turnover. And it says, upon the happening of event, they get to elect the board. The only area that's addressed is in the bylaws. And the bylaws and declaration as originally recorded did not have a hierarchy of declaration, articles, and bylaws. The provision opposing counsel cites actually is in section 3.1 of the bylaws simply says that the association is going to be controlled by the board of directors subject to chapter 607 and the Florida statutes and the governing documents. It's not saying if there's a conflict the declaration trumps over the bylaws. That provision was eventually uh, interjected into these documents in March of 2013 after this court affirmed the last appeal when we were up here. Three days later, the developer unilaterally amended the documents and inserted a provision that said the declaration controls over the bylaws. You're gonna need to wrap it up here. Thank you, Your Honor. The last point they did raise was the right to pre-suit mediation. We would simply uh, stand by our brief on that. That issue was raised in the prior uh, interlocutory appeal. This court affirmed. 
And contrary to the appellant's suggestion, uh, section 720.311 doesn't require any and every dispute between a owner and an association to be subject to pre-suit mediation. Uh, in this case, does not fall within the four very limited types of cases to be submitted to pre-suit mediation. We'd also submit that the affidavits submitted by Mr. Meadows and uh, Ms. Rayburn did not create any disputed issue of material fact. They were conclusory in nature and simply said, well, the declaration says this, the bylaws say this, that the court's role is to look at those documents. That, that doesn't create an issue of material fact. And we'd submit that there is no inconsistency. Section Article 3, uh, Section 3 of the declaration is entirely consistent with Section 3.2 of the bylaws. Again, the bylaws is the only provision that speaks to when the owners get to elect a majority of the board. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Danielle, you got eight minutes if you need them. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, addressing standing first, Your Honor, uh, there's no decision here that's adverse to Fast and Anthony and Taylor. Fast and Anthony and Taylor is not a party below. This court has already ruled on, I think, four or five different motions to dismiss that this is properly before um, the court and that the developer and the association have standing in this matter. The developer does still have rights to come before this court and appeal any decision that's adverse to it. And I don't think anybody can reasonably argue that either decision is not adverse to the developer. Um, uh, you, we went to the issue of which of the two firms um, should, uh, should be before the trial court where there, whether or not there was a conflict. Um, this is not in the order. Uh, South Millhausen, Mr. Ross said that he guessed that the trial court thought there was a conflict. It's not in the order. It's not applicable here. There's no conflict um, that was raised. There was no conflict that was argued, and there's none that's stated in the order. The substitution order is based solely on the belief that the corporate formalities were met, which they weren't, or were waived, which they weren't because of the anti-waiver provisions, or and or there was an emergency, which there's no evidence that there was. If the seven-year period in the bylaws is enforceable, does that by itself resolve at least the summary judgment issue? No, Your Honor, because of the, it, where there is a conflict, where there is an ambiguity, that creates an issue of fact um, that can be resolved either through the um, provisions in the documents themselves or through parole evidence, which is going to uh, I guess my question judgment. is, the, the key to the outcome below is whether or not the trial court accurately interpreted the, the, the enforceability of the seven-year period. Uh, and, and again, even if it accurately interprets the, to read Board of Directors, not Board of Administration, right. and seven years, even if that's true, there's still a dispute because there's a conflict. So it can't resolve. Conflict it has to. A, a it, conflict with, with the declaration. With the declaration. It has to, okay. one, interpret it. And, and, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm just trying to narrow. You all raised a lot of different issues, but it seems to me that the critical issue is that the determination that, that the bylaws don't conflict with the declaration in a fashion that keeps them from being enforceable and that he's going to change Board of Administration to Board of Directors and enforce the seven years against your clients. And, and, and if that combination of rulings is correct, does, is that dispositive of what we have in front of us? I'm not sure I'm following, Your Honor. If, okay. the, if the court interprets the, dec the, the bylaws to be the turnover provision for the direct Board of Directors, not the Board of Administrators. Correct. Does that resolve it? Yes. If there's no conflict. Well, yeah, if there's no conflict and you make the leap of, the, of assuming, which you can't do in a summary judgment, assuming that Board of Administration means Board of Directors, then that would resolve the issue. But that's not the facts that the court is presented with. So um, that's why I'm having okay. trouble understanding your question is that it just doesn't fit the facts. Well, I, I, I guess more simply stated, I mean, the question is, does seven years control this or not? And your position is not. Their position is it does. So we have to figure out, does it or doesn't it? 
Uh, That's that simple, uh, the way I see it. <laughs> there are a lot of complicated issues in this case, but that does boil down um, to a point what we're looking at. And I just wanted to talk about the issue of certiorari. Um, this court has stated in the Raisin case and also in the Alvarez versus State case, which I think is a fourth DCA case, that the issue of substituting counsel is inherently reviewable on uh, certiorari appeal and that you cannot correct such decisions on post-judgment appeals. So I'm just trying to answer that question from earlier, Your Honors. Um, the failure of due process issue is the developer got notice. He doesn't argue they did. He wasn't allowed to argue at the summary judgment hearing. It was simply cut off. It didn't argue and didn't appear at the substitution hearing because it wasn't at issue. The substitution order comes out with these terms that are directly against the developer's interest, saying that developer, you're not allowed to do anything. You're trying to control the association wrong. The developer files a motion to clarify saying, wait a minute, this wasn't argued. How do you get this order when it wasn't even argued? That's how the developer ends up before this court on that issue. Obviously, in the summary judgment uh, uh, transcript, you can see the developer wasn't allowed to give, to give any argument. So therefore, in both cases, its due process rights were violated. They haven't stated any substantial, compelling, um, competent evidence, Your Honors. They haven't stated any evidence to support the, the claims that the formalities were um, complied with or that there was an emergency. There simply is no evidence of either of those. Therefore, no substantial, competent evidence. The association, they claim the association didn't lose anything. Well, losing its right to counsel is a significant issue. So addressing that, on that issue alone, the association has the right to be before this court. They also argued that the developer was represented by separate counsel at the time of the substitution hearing. As already noted, that wasn't at issue at the time. It was shell-shocked by the substitution order, which said, you don't have any corporate identity. The Garcia case mentioned by Mr. Ross that states that governing documents must be enforced reasonably is not what the Garcia state case says. It, says that it states that board decisions must be reasonable. It doesn't say anything about enforcing governing documents and that the court gets to decide what is reasonable. And, and then even if that was true, what is unreasonable about requiring notice by mail from a director with an agenda? Those are inherently reasonable requests that are going to be in any bylaws. So even if you read in a reasonableness requirement, it was inherently reasonable to require notice in an agenda. Summary judgment order. Mr. Uh, the Fernandez's opening statement, um, Mr. Uh, Spain's opening statement rather, and the party's confused, said that the action is to enforce the right of owners regarding the governing documents. That first statement admits that it seeks to enforce the governing documents, which means that the pre-suit mediation term of Chapter 720 applies. Any time that someone comes before a court to enforce a term of governing documents, pre-suit mediation is required. And, and admit. I, I'm not quite sure I understand how pre-suit mediation is in front of this court. What, what, what order on appeal gives us the right to review that issue? The summary judgment order. The, the summary judgment order, one of the affirmative defenses in this case is that the, you cannot go forward with count seven or any of the counts in this case without mandatory pre-suit mediation. And it's mandatory, and the case law says that where you haven't, it must be dismissed and, and, and go to pre-suit mediation. So the entire summary judgment order is improper because it seeks to enforce governing documents without pre mandatory pre-suit litigation. And it's a statutory prerequisite. Had it happened, we not, might not be here today. We're here on two appeals. There's already been one appeal. Had pre-suit mediation, mandatory pre-suit mediation happened. And was that issue raised in the prior appeal? In the prior appeal, the prior appeal was an issue of whether or not there was arbitration. In that case, the, the, um, there was two motions to dismiss. There was a motion to dismiss based on motion to compel arbitration and an alternate motion which included the pre-suit mediation argument. The trial court simply denied the motion to dismiss and required 
um, an answer to be filed. We filed the answer. We stated in our firm of defenses that pre-suit mediation um, was required. It's never been decided to its finality. As we state in our brief, we address this in, I believe, our reply, which states that all issues are preserved and that just because you lose an issue on a motion to dismiss doesn't make it law of the case, doesn't mean it's been decided to finality. That issue is been and has been preserved at all times. We think it was error for the trial court not to consider the alternative motion to dismiss on the merits, but we took all of those matters in that motion and put them into our affirmative defenses. You need to wrap it up. Mr. Spain argues that there's no provision in the declaration that speaks to when the turnover is triggered. And that simply ignores the provisions of Article 3, Section 2. He jumps to Ar Section 3, argues that Article Section 2 shouldn't apply. Section 2 states that the developer shall have three votes per lot and that such voting ro rights shall remain until Class A exceeds 85% or 125, 20 days after 95% of the lots are sold. In other words, until there's 85% Class A members or 95% of the lots are sold, the developer controls. That is a turnover provision. The very next paragraph is when turnover occurs, here's how it will occur. That's direct conflict with what they argue is interpreted in the bylaws. Okay. That's Thank you. You're over your time, so we need to wrap it up. Sorry. Um, if I'm over my time, thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Next case on the docket.